Happy New Year. We might hate every minute of it, but all things become magic the minute someone says they're magic. Maybe. I love New York because it treats us all as enemies with benefits, but more likely because my many almost final moments happened here, especially that one time I got my arterial empties refilled with four liters from the five boroughs. Bad odds are the best ones to beat. A body is the thing that's interrogated by a timer on one side and sheer light on the other. So how do you half broken go without breaking in half? You have to know a secret to give it up. I never knew the partisans who sold their blood, only that their lack of other options is part of me forever, from the days before you checked for novel viruses or anything beyond a red velvet color and an arm to draw it from. Nobody's going to trick me with this go-to-the-light nonsense when the light could change with me halfway across the very busy street. Choosing how to die is what we're very good at not confronting during the weekday crosswalk two-step, and when faltering falters, there's the even more questionable live-action role-play of maybe a May-November-August threesome or any grail in comparison to the punchline of our own cellular riddle until the jacked-up lockdown won't accept a joke for the secret that was here before we were. But here we are, aren't we? Reaching for something that exists only because we reach for it, like my father's sculpture on a high shelf since he died, but which, just now, fell on the machine I'm using to write this poem. It was probably my upstairs neighbor shaking the ceiling with some online aerobics, though not long ago her grandmother's crystal pitcher did the same to her, as if to say, you might not know the secret, but the secret knows you. We might hate every minute of it, yet we want our magical nights to sachet unstoppable through the ever-changing light. We were facing the sun, but the sun turned away and left us to answer, how can I find myself in your eyes and... Be okay with what I see there. It doesn't take long for the gun nuts to Wagner the capital of what we want to think of as home, despite the leftover parts found after building it. Maybe throw out the instructions wasn't the most okay step one to put in the instructions. Even if being okay isn't the point, or hoping the dirty side of the storm scours the dour neighbors outside the window, we are powerless to do anything beyond look through. I get lost in your eyes, as though they were a city unseen since I was little and a little lost even then. Maybe it's not too late to learn to love the virus, being just new guidance for cells to find their own relief, as only the death of all prior threats can provide. Your eyes have it, and mine too, in the bug zapper outcomes coming out to play, eyes bigger than the eclipsed moon's number one penumbra, tumbling no less blindly into the light as the dark like someone full of batteries and marbles they ought not to have swallowed, or maybe more like the city whose density made life less regretful, but which also composed its essay to humanity that began, we are sorry for your loss, or an economy that resists reopening because it's only ever been a chasm we participate in by screaming as we fall. The solution was inside us all along, and remaining inside was the solution. You and I have so much in common with the virus that only wants to live, but which is so much better at it than we are. I always hoped someone would save me until I realized there is no me to save or love or even listen to except in making this that levels the self and levels up what's left. Thanks and Happy New Year. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. I've wished you a Happy New Year many times in the making of this video. And I just hope all my good wishes for you are multiplied. Many times over. I'm going to read you two recent poems with the help of my paradoxical prop here for time, timekeeping purposes. <clears throat> the first poem is Priority Was Handwritten. Looked up how to cure mouth sores again in the span of a week. This was after an object had fallen on my right foot. Exactly. 
the body trying to tell me something I refuse to accept cognitively. Naivete, a word negating what it means, spoken in reference to a third one. Bit myself while chewing a bar of something eaten in lieu of a meal of the hard and crunchy variety associated by some with anger. I had wanted to rid myself of the bad taste in my mouth. Hearing the voices in your head as sanity's only safeguard. Alice, I felt you were talking to me when saying, but you have never really been in love. And she was saying, yes, yes, once I was, am I? In Espanol. I fell once in Spanish, nunca caí el amor, but the word cliche is French, which I don't speak, and so my mouth lacks the come hither pronouncing lips, thus the invitation that never came. Language equality and linguistic equivalence are not the same thing. Absentee, the song playing on Spotify, while reading La cara no es el espejo del alma. La máscara está vacía. Habla sin lengua. El yo no existe. Behind the mask, there is no one. August. We leave the city on and off and off and on. The plants seem hardier for it, as if they too need space or the compulsoriness of our uninterrupted company sucks the air out of the room, pollutes their habitat. As if they too sense the pulsations of our reluctance. Five more days pass. In that corner of the sky, Orion is possibly the constellation whose pinholes I point out to Jane. Shadow prances as we walk over to a darker area of the field to catch the shooting stars. The sadness of the turn the poem took takes us by surprise. We find ourselves welling up. We find ourselves verbing. We lose our grip. Once, to love the city, you have to hate it every now and then. Disappointment preordained by expectation of returns. There's intermittent eroticism, the erotics of intermittence, and dead ends. Andy says he's gone for good. Aki and Makiko head back to Japan. Neighbors leave for the suburbs. Even Angela, East Village born and bred, wants out. The skyline discontinues itself at night, but sidewalk furniture doesn't go unwanted. We rarely visited the joint down the street, many board blank, awning still there. At the waterfront park, a man in disbelief goes on about another man, a Staten Islander who's not once set foot in Central Park. Across the river, we get stuck in traffic on 42nd. A truck driver keeps his cool, plays a flute between lights. The wax museum's reopened. Outside, Minnie takes a breather, mouse mask dangling from neck, mask over nose and mouth. We make it another river over, past American Dream, a giant brand new complex sitting empty in Jersey. Blessings for the new year and for the planet. Lost title last night. Stumble upon broken ground cat afoot. Planets pulse with light southern sky. Air is a wet curtain. Hairs alarm forearm. Motion detector switches on bright eyes. Side effects aside, we've gold crowns who knock the shovel on the porch over. The moons of Elul are fading louder. I am a beetle who wakes in darkness. Blessings are turning orange on maples, following their mad flight among winds. Litter your days to fodder approving suns. Pieces and pieces, attorneys pro bono, so relief for sorrows, for raying connections, touching virtual spotlessness complete. Hi there, my name is Judah Rubin. This is Jackson. We're going to be reading to you from Cesario Martinez's 1977 uh, 
poem, um, five pure reasons to side with the strike, which coincided with the um, 1977 general strike in Peru. Peruvian drum roll with Romualdo as backdrop. They will throw sand with Rocoto in our eyes, and they will not defeat us. They will pull the air from our lungs and pockets, and they will not defeat us. They will burn our houses, and in their fury, the National Bank, and they will not defeat us. They will offer us the kingdom of heaven and the hills, and they will not defeat us. They will try to seal our eyes and our ears, and they will not defeat us. They will want to transplant our hearts, heads, and livers, and they will not defeat us. They will try to pull off our nails and burn our tongues, and they will not defeat us. They will spit fire, they will yank at our legs, and they will not defeat us. They will pull our people into the abyss, and they will not defeat us. They will rescue our people from those abysses, and they will not defeat us. They will whip us with well-educated snakes, and they will not defeat us. They will offer us on the market like a curious species, and they will not defeat us. They will want to buy us with our own money, and they will not defeat us. They will perform their pirouettes. They will dance for us, and they will not defeat us. They will have Peru win in soccer and smirks, and they will not defeat us. They will threaten us with hell, with Yanamayo, and they will not defeat us. They will threaten us with beatings and thrashings, and they will not defeat us. They will not defeat us. They will not defeat us, and they will not defeat us, because we defend our lives with our lives. I would like to say, I would like to say, I don't know the road to paradise that my tongue, the people, and that man sitting contemplating the railway lines in a deep meditation nobody would ever know existed. My house existed in a place I'm still seeking. It wasn't in this village where I witnessed other children being born on the same blood-stained mattress I was born on, in the same room to which the midwife regularly came when she went away with the bit and took away my tongue. I saw myself searching for that old mattress stained with the blood of all those who had already come into the world so there would be another child drowned here. I saw myself not looking for a house but making a search for a house my way. So much blood dried like rust as each cut of the scalpel breached my skin. Each cut of the scalpel piercing me as I lay dead and anesthetized. I would have loved the time of the anesthesia to lead me to the day you are no more. A day you can calculate for $50 on a net. I would like to say, I write about what I lost, about my vanished blood, about my laughter frozen in Damask, about this young girl who was chased away because she sighed next to the wheat dunes that stuffed the young girl's mouth with secrets, about this girl who was and is no more, about another one I saw spinning under the ceiling of the empty living room, her dress on fire, she calls to her master to save her, and standing naked in front of all those men. I say, I want neither father nor mother nor to have them put on my road or slipped into my story. Without them, I remain, and in spite of them all, I am. I don't know the road to paradise. I didn't save you from hell. Sharia, that void didn't strike me. I will not go to the one who has gone and will inevitably return. I wrote lines, licked the drops from the face, I said, she is one of those whose past bears the present. She dashed along the wide avenue trying to cross. Like me, you also are a traveler. Without coyness, you come bearing that light. Or is it this mist that kills us? Shoot, kill, arch dark bird. Fall to earth on your feathers that a wind blowing from the Sahara scatters. Sand tunes, purple light that you cross from where you are not. This Sahara, our home, there, two poles. The coming will not come, visiting, rather. He is your guest, 
suddenly shy when he sits food vanishes enchanted to where your awakening is you the sublime magus amon tell me where you keep your remains where i can find what leads me to them you the thing the non-being when they appeared fire had covered the light i write on your whereabouts to meditate on you to envision imagine your shadow you sublime creature be a little that i may see you that i may say you Hi, everybody, and Happy New Year, and Happy Birthday to C.A. Conrad. This is my favorite event of the year, and I want to thank Laura and Nicole and Kyle and everybody at the Poetry Project for keeping the flame alive so brilliantly, so creatively, so ethically. I'm going to read to you from one of my favorite books that came out this year, from a new um, a first book first chapbook from a poet named M. Ryan Murphy. Um, and I also happened to write the blurb for the book, but as I was reading the book for the blurb, I was sort of blown away. And it um, it's a book that I want to get attention and it comes out of a small, small press called Damaged Goods Press. And I don't know uh, how they're doing or what they're doing in COVID. So many people are suffering. And so please look for this book. It's called Void of Pronouns by M. Ryan Murphy, such a brilliant, important, important book um, for all people who think about queerness and bodies and non-binary issues, but also about language and what how language can enter our experience. I'm gonna read a tiny bit from my blurb and then I'll read um, from the middle section called Body. I read M. Ryan Murphy's Void of Pronouns like I read philosophy making a space for each movement, each caressing and genderless sentence before physically, psychically agreeing to move on to the next, a slow and deep kind of reading, which is a kind of reading that is the kind I like, which also happens to be the kind of sex I like. A body. One, a body void of pronouns doesn't belong to the mirror. Day starts as child again, mother's room. The mirror phase is double recognition, one of a body, one of distance. The new moon is there and not. A body is there, but not. How to love the nothing strives the something. Two, learning to love a body void of pronouns is like convincing the mind to speak a new language. Takes patience and struggle. Many blue days, cloudless or cloudy. This must be good. Deep ocean dwellers seeing specks of light leave the trench briefly. In this way, all time is speculation, exploration, and a body feels so heavy now. Three. A body void of pronouns dances both light and dark in a beautiful display of sex organ shuffle, a visual disconnect. A body sees the powered nature rejects the member while still feeling love, sometimes not, doesn't know how to exist anymore. A sentence is never enough to tell the story. A trench only so deep hits rock and the concrete is halting. Four, begging a body void of pronouns to step outside today. Let sunlight lick the form, a loving gesture. Sensing the edges, the outlines, not the issue. A need for infrastructural upheaval is known in the way rays heat a body's insides. Organs too cold to be housed within this temple. Penn says summertime sadness. A body says, life's always cool-toned and floating. Dust comes, 
and nothing changes. Five, a body void of pronouns already knows compassion, a product of years of alienation, societal and personal, the light-headed effect of a strong morning coffee, writing each letter within a space striving heart, a shift away from the almighty brain or the rise of a heart mind, the dumbfounded awe an Irish countryside bears and witness calls for a silence. Penn asks if the brain moves a body. A body responds by lifting pen to chest. Beat, beat, this is good. I'm going to read a segment from my new book. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Uh, this is from a long poem called My East Village. This is section eight, Utopia Redux. And now I come to Lewis Warsh and Bernadette Mayer who I met in Boulder, Colorado at Naropa University where they were leading workshops June of 78. I blended into their household as if there were no barriers and would for the next several years be a regular presence amid the routine proceedings of the day, which in their system was nothing like ordinary. I'm not sure from where their income was arriving but they each were available day and night the first year or two I knew them and spent the time together in care of infant daughter Marie and in ensuing years joined in quick succession by Sophie and Max. I suppose I was quietly astounded participating as witness to the leisurely unfolding of the days and nights passing with little urgency. From first light spent entertaining and feeding the children and the evenings, once the kids were in bed, devoted to writing, each of the authors settled at their desks, the racket of two typewriters commingling from different rooms, a literary symphony of industrious enterprise producing words I yearned to read. Bernadette, a new age goddess and a formidable presence, overhauled my value system, wrenching me out of my caveman sensibilities disturbing my soul in its new reckoning. Her writing fractured narrative, reordering components of description and response into a new form of matter, much as my proclivities adjusted fortunate in her presence. Lewis was the embodiment of Jean-Pierre Liot, actor of the French New Wave, 
who was a role model for me in college years, illustrating how males could be tender and introspective. I'd help them move, once from Lenox, Massachusetts to Henniker, New Hampshire, where they both secured teaching positions. One transfer resettled them for a summer at a house called Whispering Pines, which recalled for me perhaps the most heavenly of songs by the band, On Lake Buell in the Berkshires. And I drove a rental truck once again, this time to a spacious two bedroom apartment with French doors in the Agaloff Towers, standing stately between East Third and East Fourth on Avenue A, where many spaghetti dinners would take place with more than a few jugs of red wine consumed in the ensuing years as Bernadette took over the position of artistic director of the poetry project, where I was already administrative assistant along with Gary Linhart and Bob Holman became the program coordinator. In the summer of 81, I invited the Warsh Mayer family, which now included three kids, to join me for a month long house sitting gig in rural Connecticut, perhaps the most bucolic and pleasant month of my earth time, luxuriating with my adopted family away from the grim conclusion of the city, transplanted to a setting with a strawberry field down the road, a horse in a stable in the yard, and a lake to bring the children to in the hot afternoons, see at Maureen's. Between prepping meals, keeping the children entertained, hosting a slew of visitors who'd arrived from the city, and writing at night, we read a lot of books we'd borrow from the library. I read everything Lewis told me to read. The locale in the quiet countryside, our comfort with each other, our being far from New York, whatever it was, the arrangement was conducive to an unperturbed yet focused engagement with piles of print matter, a paradise shielded from toxic interferences by good fortune and the Mayor Warsh, no conflict is front page approach. Thank you, thanks to Kyle and everybody at the Pope Raj. Saludos, I am Ricardo Alberto Maldonado. Hello, my name is Omatari James. We will be reading a diptych consisting of two poems, two sonnets. We wrote using images um, that came to us or images we sought out uh, in 2020 with uh, the idea of manifesting a kinder um, 2021. Ars Poetica with a bang and whimper. Only a black mother will tell you with a straight face and stretched belly that she didn't want you to be a statistic. Math makes a poet of us all, made me homeland and diaspora, half ship and half sea. Love catches up to loss eventually follows the arc of failure. What I am trying to say is mathematical. The fragment of hope implies the fractal imagination, a multiplication of feathers behind what the eye reads and what the mind understands. Reader, I have been picked up, put down, and considered casually and constantly, which is the slope of beauty. I have two origin stories. I don't know who I am. For every new flag, an old suffering. Let this fire consume as much as it wants. This ruin could be anything, no more bark wood, cane or papyrus. I was not made to bear fruit, a sty in the eye of glory. I have two origin stories. I know who I am, born 
from an earlier God play, praised for my natural geometry. My enemy bends me at the waist, minute barbed wire blossom. I do not know winter. Innocence survives everything. My only tree bears fruit. I was the original. Inglés sin barreras. This is the America I carry in my belly. Doubt for the state, the blood after Selma. The Americans die. The flags were consumed by fire. The Americans dying. Satellites fall into minerals and silver. Flowers blossomed for a state engendered in laws by a slashed finger dipped in salt. The poem was a sketch of a precedent in life flesh. A body at seaside, the barren labyrinth of a mind tying birds to the temple. The coastal shell settles a homeland and its diaspora and the footwear of the sea, so many bodies of unnamed flowers becoming a people prayer. The sea was the poetry of the people, the will of a god in barbed wire being freed. The dark belly incarnates nylon white. First activity, democracy. Which adjective is chosen now, being myself the electorate? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hello, Happy New Year. Um, my name is Mary Mida Pariskar. Uh, reading to you from the ghost of 2020 pandemic year past. Um, you are watching this in 2021, where I hope there are better horizons for all of us to look toward. Um, always, right? Uh, so I'm going to read a poem um, called By You Time. The shout out to fellow Texan Monica Teresa Ortiz, um, who created this space where this poem first began to come together. So By You Time. I miss its reservoir slowness, even after coming to know its man-made quality offset of a faster river, a holding zone for flood water. Sitting on the bridge, not doing anything but looking for the turtles you knew when you were just learning how to leave the cul-de-sac at the end of your block. Bayou time is slow time, like summer not empty of threat, still on the move we keep beside it. So much time thinking of being looked at, I forgot to look. As though familiar, even the bath water has slowed swamp-like, pooling foam, its slow flow down the drain. Aspirations around the corner behind you, having wanted a decent life, how they learned to make peace with brutal settlements, becoming Roman, that is, Texan. Empire keeps the people who love you away from home, so they make home an empire waiting to find life in its intervals, trying to love you there. So occupied by its rhythm, they forgot to do nothing. So busy meeting desires, not dreaming of one's own possession. Discards beside the road once in a while, a shopping cart stirs fear of water, what was done to its body. Still waiting to tuck away beside it, who makes home in this waste, all the abandonments of production. Beside them, I am naive again, picking stems of wildness to chew for a small pungence on the tongue that little pleasure. More herons than I had ever seen in the city while the city stays wounding. I miss it, the island of trees in the middle of the reservoir full of grackles waiting, and for what? The end of human governance giving a shape to give names premised on time. Who named all this grief excess? Who named this collective sensation as void? They stay in the branches, put on their elegant iridescent airs of being unmastered. Thank you again and happy new year to you and all of us. Uh, 
Happy New Year from quarantine in Paris. The Crater. At 3 a.m. or whatever time it happens, life in San Marino, California isn't much, but it's what it is. A gun fires in a house, and now it's something for them. Others in the house, mother, brother, are roughly woken up. They think about the sound, recognize it, and that's that. It's the least surprise ever, or not it, or that it happened, or with a gun, or that they had to hear it, or why now, but why. The brother, now awake, not just the brother, stands before the noisy door. He hears Nick Drake. He says, George, loud enough to penetrate the door in Drake, but it's not a question. His mother is behind him down the hall. He can feel it, but he's too shocked to turn and say, don't come. What do they feel? I don't know, but it must be very ugly since so much of it is hatred. The door is locked. George, George, George. George is, I don't know, sitting slumped forward. Blood is pouring from his mouth and nose, I was told that. There's a crater in his head, the top back part. It's full of mangled brains and skull and blood. He fired into his mouth, I was told, and so it would have to be there. The crater can't talk or do anything. It needs an artist. The brother kicks the door in. The room's very small and he sees what I described. What I described will be the only thing he ever sees when he remembers George beginning now and more resolutely once he has to make a choice between looking at a box of ashes on his mother's mantelpiece or remembering this. This would be like George's album cover. Don't, Mom, don't, he says. Someone calls emergency and let's say a vehicle arrives. Two men in uniforms get out. Both men, since women weren't thought capable of transcending this much trauma in the 80s. They enter the house. One is older, tough. The other is young and took the job for different reasons. They're shown George's body and hate it. The young one, Joe, let's say, is the one who has to do things around the body. And the older one, named something else who cares, is the one who has to go into the living room and ask the family questions and then use their phone to call in a report. How old, the older one says. 30, George's mother says, it's his birthday. You can guess the rest. In two days, George will be ashes. He'll weigh 4.7 pounds. There'll be a funeral to which almost no one is invited. The estranged father, stoners from the park that George had started hanging out with, people who'd been kids when George was and haven't seen him since. They won't invite me. They could call my mother's house and try to reach me, but they won't. Nick Drake won't be played. There'll be no obituary in the local paper. No one in the family will want to write it. They'll redo the room, sell the house, move. They won't tell the newer owners. They'll just erase an awful, sick, depressing man. Joe is in the room doing things he's assigned to do. He looks at the body from different angles, in detail, up close, at the bloody face, at the bloody floor, at the gun, at the hand it's resting on, always writing notes or checking boxes on a form clamped to a clipboard. He keeps looking at the crater. He can't help it. He has no feelings that he knows of, and the wound is fascinating to him, even though it's what it is and there's nothing to write down about it. Why are you so interested? asks the crater. The voice is male, like the body would have had, but not as huge as you would think a voice of someone who would do that self to himself to be. And the crater doesn't move in sync with it or even shiver like a woofer. Joe is startled, but he's always startled when something like that happens. Death is so unknown. I'm an artist, he says. I look at everything artistically. It's easier that way. I was an artist too, the crater says, or I tried to be. What kind, Joe asks. My body played guitar, the crater says. Joe goes back to doing what he's told to do. The crater has gone silent for a while, so maybe it has died. You there, Joe asks it. Thinking, the crater says. About what, Joe asks. A friend, the crater says. 
a good friend? Joe asks. Yes, but not good enough, the creator says. Thank you.